Hi, thanks so much. Wow. So, first off, how many people here have ever been, been to or seen a TED Talk? Show of hands. Whoa, that's like the best response I've ever gotten to this question. I see some people didn't, didn't raise their hands, and、uh, so if you haven't ever been to a TED Talk, I highly recommend it. It's really,、uh, really stimulating. But the fact that most of you have been tells me something. It tells me that you're intrinsically motivated to learn. Okay? It's like, that means you do it for the joy of learning. It really feels good. You don't have extrinsic rewards that make you do it. No one's paying you, and、uh, no one's threatening to punish you if you don't do it. And、uh, you're not doing it for hedonic. Rewards, right? It's not that the TED Talk tastes good or it,、um, it、uh, stimulates you sexually. I mean, I'm assuming, <laughs> right? And so, so that's really interesting. It's really interesting to me because I work in trying to motivate people and get them excited、uh, to learn about science. And、um, that entire idea and that, that、uh, phrase, intrinsic learning, was coined by Harry Harlow. At the、uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, when he saw rhesus monkeys playing this mechanical puzzle. And he was like, well, that's really interesting because they're really into it and they're not getting any rewards to do that. And at the time, you know, it was,、uh, psychology was dominated by behaviorism and the idea that, you know, we only do things if we're rewarded. For doing them, or if we're going to be punished for not doing them. And so the behaviorists saw this and they were like, well, this is, this is crazy. Why are they playing with this puzzle? And so we said, well, let's reward them. Let's give them a treat the longer they play with that puzzle. And a weird thing happened the rhesus monkeys that got rewarded didn't play it longer. In fact, they were less interested. They were somehow, when it was their idea, when it was autonomous, it was really engaging for them. But as soon as there were extrinsic rewards for it, it actually became less interesting to them. So, they, and it wasn't known until you know, decades later that the brain has its own reward system, or systems, many of them. And、uh, you might have seen these,、uh, you know, the films of the Um, the rats that press the lever and they have an electrode going into their brain that, that rewards them. And、um, they will keep pressing that lever and ignore food or anything, sex or anything. They're just going to keep pressing that lever and getting that direct stimulation to the brain until they drop. And、um, you know, what we usually hear. Is that, oh, it's like they're getting morphine or something. They're getting this you know, euphoria from you know, that part of the brain. But if you watch them, they don't, you know, they don't like press the lever and go, ah,、uh, ah,、uh, oh yeah. They, they press the lever and they go, they do that. They have this. Expectance, this anticipation, this feeling that there's something more. See, I worked in the theme of this TEDx <laughs> cleverly and seamlessly into my talk. I didn't notice that. And, and、uh, so then some scientists began to think well, they're not stimulating the part,、uh, you know, something similar to the morphine reward system or something like that. They're triggering the same rewards that we get from intrinsically motivated behavior. So it's a feeling of there's something there. I'm going to learn something new. I'm going to find something valuable. And that really feels good. So what they're really doing is they're administrating a concentrated TED talk <laughs> right into their brain. That feeling, I'm going to learn something new. This is really. So that's really interesting to me because I am, I work at the education directorate for the、uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, and,、uh, or AAAS, as the cool kids call it. And、um, 
I am not interested in teaching science. I'm interested in seeing how people get motivated, especially kids, to be enthusiastic learners and doers and people who are really jazzed up by that. And so this idea of intrinsic motivation was really interesting to me. And it's a hard thing to do in school because we saw from the rhesus monkeys that it has to be autonomous. It has to be something you do because you want to do. It has to be self-motivated and exploratory. And if you add rewards and punishments, it kills it. And schools, by their nature, aren't crazy about unleashing autonomous behavior. And there are a lot of rewards and punishments. So I work in out-of-school, after-school environments. And Particularly, I'm just starting a project in national parks to see how we can get um, kids and grown-ups uh, sort of motivated to explore and get excited about science in that environment. Now, the other thing I do at AAAS is a daily radio program called Science Update. It's a new, short little uh, uh, story every single day about exciting work in science. And so I've been doing this for 30 years now. And so I've talked to thousands and thousands of scientists, and I thought, wow, I think that maybe if I um, talk to some of them, they can give me feedback on what got them so jazzed up about science. So for this talk, I reached out to a couple of my favorites. And so one of my favorites, Oh, yeah, that's, that's not the actual scientist. That's, uh, <laughs> who knows what that is? Star-nosed mole. First time I saw a star-nosed mole when I was a kid in a, um, in a book, I was like, I must have one. <laughs> it's, it was, talk about, you know, just that, it was, and you, know, you couldn't tell in the book how big they were, so I was assuming they were like maybe, I don't know, like the size of a seal. And I pictured myself taking it for a walk and taking it to school and what a sensation it would be. Um, but it turns out they're just like the size of a, a hamster. And the, the little star nose um, is just like the size of your fingertip. But it has these 22 appendages and it doesn't use them to smell, it uses them to feel. And it burrows underground, it can't see underground, and it does this thing with them. It's like and that, that was in slow motion. So I can't move at mole speeds. It's incredible. In fact, the, the star-nosed mole is the world's fastest eater. And it's in the Guinness Book of World Records. And <laughs> seriously. And, 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 and it, it, it can do this because of these appendages and how they can feel so quickly. Now, this fellow who studies them, and he's been on my show a couple times, Ken Catania at Vanderbilt, and he's a neuroscientist. And, um, you know, he had scientists for parents, and he used to go exploring when he was a kid. And when he was young, he came upon a star-nosed mole that was dead. And he didn't know what it was, but it stuck in his mind. And again, he sort of looked at that and said, there is something more to that than, you know, than just a pretty face. <laughs> and sure enough, he, he has studied these for decades now, and he's found that each of those little appendages has its own area of the brain that it sends signals to. And when it does that, all those areas of the brain talk to each other and create this coherent picture that allows it to decide whether that's food or, some, or not food in an instant. And now you're saying, wait a minute, our tax dollars are going to pay because some guy as a kid saw this creature and decided he wanted to say star-nosed moles. This is, this is what's wrong with America today. What possible use could this be? Well, it turns out it's very, very, very useful because one of the most profound and important uh, puzzles in neuroscience is how do we make sense of the world? We get all this data from our eyes and our ears and our nose. It's the only way we see the world but it comes to us as little bits, just like the star-nosed mole's different things when it does that. And somehow our brain puts that all together into this coherent experience that, we, that allows us to, to 
to function. And there are you know, very uh, disabling mental conditions where that part of the brain doesn't function very well. And you can't study this in people, but star-nosed moles are perfect for this and easily mapped and easily... St and so Ken's work is unlocking some of the most profound mysteries in neuroscience. And for that, he won the MacArthur Award, the, you know, the Genius Award. And so really important work that you would never suspect. Um, but you know, he had scientist parents, and he had um, uh, experiences when he was young. And so I'm thinking, OK, early motivation, autonomous exploration could be really useful. The next person that I turned to was not a scientist, it was an art teacher that my sister had uh, 50 years ago in high school. And the thing about Mr. Carroll was he was obsessed with turtles to the point where the kids would like and say, I think Mr. Carroll is a turtle. I think he becomes a turtle at night and swims in the pond with the other turtles. Because kids are cruel. <laughs> but, they but they loved him, and he was a great teacher. And so I'm working on this, 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 uh, this talk, and I'm thinking, I wonder what ever happened to Mr. Carroll, and if he's alive, and if he's still obsessed with turtles. So I go, and you should know, I'm, I'm ADHD, right? And so I, I will chase anything down. I will, I'm like all over the place, and I don't even know where this talk is going to end up. You know? I, well, <laughs> Just hang with me here. But so I look, and sure enough, he is alive. And there are a million David Carroll turtle responses on, the, on Google when you search for him. It turns out that he has become famous for being the turtle guy. He's written books about turtles. He has a book called Self-Portrait um, uh, with Turtle. He has... Uh, <laughs> He was a National Book Award finalist for his work. And um, not only that, but unexpectedly, he is contributing to science because all of his, when he does his paintings of turtles, and he goes out and studies them, he takes notes. And one of the ways we learn about ecosystems and how they change over time is years and years of detailed notes, and he has them. So he's become a, uh, really useful to the science community and he won a MacArthur Genius Award. And so, amazing. And so the first, I didn't know either of these, the first two people I picked turned out to be MacArthur geniuses. And so I said, well, how did you get excited by turtles? Because I, I emailed him, and here's what he said. I slipped into a world that was just incredible. And I was already spellbound just seeing the stream and dragonflies, frogs, and this backwater marsh with reeds, and it was just so entrancing. And then I saw something moving in the reeds, and I watched to see what am I going to see next, you know? And this is, this is a pattern for life now. What is next out here? And this tremendously beautiful, I didn't know what species or kind it was, of course, but this black shell, yellow spotted turtle appeared, and that was it. <laughs> All right, and so what was really important to me about Mr. Carroll is he did not have an a, uh, encouraging environment for exploration when he was a kid. He was in a city until he moved to, a country, to the country when he was eight. But his parents weren't scientists like Ken's. They didn't encourage autonomous exploration. They kind of forbid it. But he saw this bit of woods near a new home they had moved to, and he was drawn to it. And as soon as he went in, that was it. In fact, I have here, a, due to a, a great technology called retrospective positron emission tomography, an image of his brain at the age of eight. <laughs> so. In case you're not a neuroscientist, let me, I can interpret this. <laughs> After that experience, turtles were his life. I mean, he had other, other things, but he would, he would uh, feel this excited anticipation about exploring uh, every day, and he would slip back there, even though you know, he didn't have any outside encouragement to do so. Now, for comparison purposes, here's the same skin of my brain at the age of eight. <laughs> 
previous brain, brain of MacArthur Genius Award winner. This brain, this is the brain of someone who does a one-minute radio show on a different topic every day. <laughs> Now, our next scientist studies bees. Now, you hear a lot about honeybees and that sort of thing, but. Honeybees are domestic animals. You know, those were brought here from Europe to to take care of our crops and pollinate, and they are very important. But we have native bees that live here in all sorts of shapes and sizes and variety, and they're not social in most parts, so they don't sting. They're not. They don't. Um, they don't harm people. They're beautiful. And this is the fellow, Sta Sam Drogi, um, who studies them. And、um, he had similar stories about autonomous exploration when he was a kid and going out. And he fell in love with bees at a certain point, and he never looked back. And、uh, he has not yet won the MacArthur Genius Award, but they sh he should. Now, I asked him, doesn't this sort of Love uh, uh, can it border on obsession. I mean, you guys have de all devoted literally decades of your life to studying this one thing, and、um, he said it can. It actually can, and、uh, you have to sort of get this balance between this, you know, object of your study and real life, and.、Um, But you know he's managed to do that. He knows others that actually have difficulty, you know, managing relationships with humans after they've become so involved with、uh, with their、uh, object of their study. And this last one, I don't have the picture of the person, but this is a ghost orchid. And I put this up here because there was this uh, uh, book by Susan Orleans, the Orchid Thief, about a person who's obsessed with orchids. To the point of self-destruction, so he basically, you know, was so obsessed with these that he would try to get endangered orchids out of the Everglades, and he got arrested.、Um, so you can take it too far. So just to wrap up, because I have gone on longer than I expected here, here's what I've learned from these guys. First, early exposure very useful. That gets that. Intrinsic that feeds that intrinsic motivation. Having、um, support from family isn't critical, and having、um, a lot of opportunity, you can still do it, which is really important for me because I work with a lot of kids who don't have a lot of support, who don't have scientists for um, parents. Um, and and、um, the other thing they all have in common is just this real love of their subject. Um, that comes through. They take pictures of their subject. They, they.、Uh, it's more than just a professional interest. But I've run out of time. I just want to leave you with the the main thing that separates the really successful folks that that win genius awards and achieve great things, and that is executive function. The ability to get out of that. There's something more. Feeling that feels really good, just like those rats hitting the bar, but doesn't lead to anything of substance. One way to get over that, that and I'll,、uh, this is a, a tip that I can share with you. It works every time. Terror. When you're terrified, when you're seeking something, like you have a deadline and you have to do a TED talk, all of a sudden. The amygdala comes in, this fear center that makes the hair on the back of your—well, if you have hair on the back—stand up, and all of a sudden, that seeking behavior is replaced by "I'm focused. I have to get this done. I have to take action now." And now, I said I had an answer. I didn't say it was a useful answer, unless you like pay someone to come and beat you up if you don't move into action when you have something to do. But one thing that you can do, and one thing that I'll be exploring in some of the research that I'm, I'm just embarking on in national parks, is taking, you know, once you're in this exploratory mode, and you can use this while, you know, throughout this day when you're at TED Talks, try to do something that will sort of obligate you to go further before, beyond 
there's something more style anticipation. Try to write something down. Make a promise to somebody that you're going to take action on something that really got you jazzed up. If it's this talk, it might be citizen science. You think this is really cool. There are citizen science projects you can sign up for where you actually contribute to science. And once you do that, then you have this sort of obligation to not only seek endlessly in or out in a national park or whatever, but to then deliver your data to those people. And so it's that sort of ability to sort of take charge of your explorations that takes this excited, anticipatory, there's something more ellipses feeling, and then replace it with the satisfaction and the exclamation point to actually achieving something more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.